So it's time to, to call Professor Richard Henderson um, to, to, the, to the webinar. And I'll be starting by saying a few words to introduce him. So it is my great honor and privilege to, to serve as host today to Professor Richard Henderson. So Professor Henderson was born in 1945 in Edinburgh and it began as a physicist. However, at the age of 21, Professor Henderson uh, got seduced by molecular biology and switched field. He firstly worked at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, where he joined the team led by historic crystallographer Professor David Blow, working out the atomic structure of chymotrypsin, one of the first few protein structures to be determined using X-ray crystallography. Uh, Professor Henderson then went as a Helen Hay Whitney postdoctoral fellow to the Yale University, where he developed an interest in the structure of membrane proteins, uh, working for a few years on voltage-dependent uh, ion channels. He then returned to MRC LMB in 1973, where he began to collaborate with Nigel Unwin, and together they've developed electron microscopy into a tool for the direct determination of the structure of proteins, and applied it most notably to the light-driven proton pump bacteriorhodopsin from hollow bacteria. Since then, Professor Henderson worked to solve a number of technical and conceptual problems with the limited, the attainable resolution of electron crystallography, leading to the first atomic structure of bacteriorhodopsin by using electron microscopy and diffraction, and eventually led to the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2017. Together with Jacques Dubochet and Joachim Frank, Professor Richard Henderson was given the Nobel Prize for developing cryoelectron crystallography for the high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution, leading to the uh, resolution revolution that structural biology field is nowadays experiencing. Um, Professor Henderson was joint head of the Division of Structural Studies at the MRC Laboratory from 86 to 2001, and it has been its director from 96 to 2006. Among the several accolades Professor Henderson has received, I will just mention a few. Professor Henderson is member, a member of uh, AMBO, Fellow of the Royal Society, when, uh, winner of the Rosenstiel and uh, Louis Jante Awards, member of the United States National Academy of Sciences, fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, winner of the Gregory Aminov Prize for Crystallography from the Royal Swedish Academy, distinguished scientist award and honorable member of the Microscopy Society of America, winner of the Copley and Kyle Lindstrom Lang medals, honorable member of the Royal Society of Chemistry, and of course, winner of the 2017 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. So please join me in a very warm welcome to Professor Richard Henderson, and he will be talking to us about the cryo-EM revolution in structural biology. Professor Henderson, thank you again so much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Jose. <laughs> you managed to do a grand job on uh, reminding me of all those past history. Um, but yeah, today um, I'd like to focus on, uh, let's say, modern generation uh, electron cryomicroscopy. And uh, let me begin by sharing my screen and going to the first slide, which is just the title of the talk. Um, so the, the, the general idea is that I would tell you a bit about uh, how electron cry microscopy, cry OEM as we call it, about the impact that it's made over the last few years, although uh, people have been trying for 20 or 30 years to make it better. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, how it's rapidly in the last few years become, it's become the dominant method really in structural biology. Um, whereas before it was the sort of second rank behind the X-ray crystallography. So I thought today I'll tell you a bit about the history, some of the recent and very recent achievements of cryo-EM. Uh, I'll mention tomography, although that's a minor part of uh, my own interests, and then say a little bit about where we think the future is going, because obviously it's still in a growth phase and has quite a long way to go. So I thought um, I'd begin with uh, the first slide, which... Tim Baker, who 
was a postdoc here in Cambridge about 40 years ago, but now he's uh, retired emeritus at San Diego. But he and I were asked to write a chapter for the International Tables for Crystallography about 20 years ago, when there were um, about 80 or 90 chapters all about X-ray crystallography, different types of um, use of X-rays. But there were only two chapters on electrons, one on electron diffraction that Hua Chu now at Stanford wrote, and this one which was focused on electron microscopy. And this is the main slide we made in that there were some graphs and things like that, but this was the main illustration that we made 20 years ago to try to show in general what is cryo-EM, how, how well it could do then, and maybe uh, in the article a little bit where we were going. And of course, uh, as the method has developed, it's turned out once you get over a certain hurdle, it's developed more, more quickly than we all thought. So it's been more successful and developed more rapidly than we, we thought. But this slide shows uh, uh, four different specimens that neither Tim nor I had worked on, and we picked them as representative at the time of where things were going. And uh, the first panel shows uh, a field of view of 70 S E. coli ribosomes from the work that Joachim Frank's group um, was doing at that time. So this is the Gabashvili et al. paper published in the year 2000. And it shows an 11 angstrom structure of the ribosome where you were, they were able to find and identify the large subunit, the small subunit, long bits of RNA and the tRNA. Uh, so that's, that's a single particle, uh, not crystalline without any symmetry. And then the second panel are single particles, again, randomly distributed in the, in the thin film of ice that it's been frozen in of the hepatitis B virus cores. And this was a specimen Bettina Botcher worked on when she was a postdoc here um, with Tony Crowther. And they were able to get in 1997, the first uh, sub 10 angstrom, so sub nanometer structure by single particle EM, which had the benefit of all the averaging from the icosahedron. And these spikes sticking out from the surface of the icosahedral particle, you can see these spikes have little ridges along them. So it's a four helix bundle um, protruding from the surface of the virus. And that was sort of a, an indication of how higher symmetry helps you to make more rapid progress than, than particles without symmetry. And then the third panel were, was a helically arranged structure, which is basically the thin filaments from muscle where actin and myosin filaments slide past one another. And Ron had worked for many years on this and they did this uh, difference map approach where they could take cryo EM images and uh, do the computing, convert it into a 3D structure. And the, the blue shading in the middle is, came from a, a filament of pure actin. And then uh, the green is tropomyosin, which makes the thin, you know, is the main, one of the main components in the thin filament. And then the, the, the pink, orange and yellow are different domains of the myosin head group that binds to the thin filament and pulls the muscle along it. And, and even at 30 angstrom resolution in, in 1995, they were able to, that really helped them to understand how muscle works. And now, of course, all of these components, there are atomic resolution maps uh, from sometimes from X-ray, sometimes from cryo-EM. And then the last panel was how I personally got, made the transition from being an X-ray crystallographer to being an electron crystallographer initially, and then electron microscopy without crystals eventually. This is a crystal of, of light harvesting complex, which is the main pigment out there in green plants. We look out the window and it's all green. This is the pigment. And Werner Kuhlbrandt had picked this to work on when he was a postdoc in Switzerland about 1982 and had worked on it for about 10 years, making 2D crystals, uh, analyzing them by electron diffraction and electron microscopy. And here is the structure showing the trimer. Uh, each of the proteins is 25 kilodaltons. It has three transmembrane helices, and then there are 13 or 14 chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B molecules bound to it. And then the holes in between the protein are filled in with lipid in this 2D crystal. And because it's a crystal, you could get higher resolution. So this was 3.4 angstroms rather than 37 and 11 at the time. And since then, there have been, of course, uh, quite a few more atomic level uh, 2D crystal structures. But it turns out in the end that it's 
just as hard to make really good 2D crystals as it is to make well-ordered and well-diffracting 3D crystals. So many of us, including our, our, uh, our group in Cambridge, from about mid-1990, from roughly 1995 onwards, we stopped doing uh, 2D electron crystallography and started to focus entirely on the single particle work. And then now you would add, in addition to this, these four sort of styles of uh, specimen that you might study by cryo-EM, there's also been very uh, big developments in electron cryotomography. And I'll show a couple of slides about this later on and sort of uh, uh, Wolfgang Baumeister and Grant Jensen have been the leaders in developing the, the tomography technology. So you'd add a fifth panel now. But of all the people who've contributed to uh, the development of cryo-EM, uh, for example, there was, you know, there was Bob Glazer, Joachim Frank worked on single particles, then negative stain, and then got involved in, in cryo uh, ourselves, Marin Van Heel. But of all those people, the, the one group that made the biggest uh, step forward, and I, in my view, is the one that has laid the foundations for cryo-M as we know it now, uh, is Jacques Dubochet, who is now uh, retired, but he's still in Lausanne, and they're now having a, a Dubochet Institute in Lausanne focused on um, cryo-M and, and the tomography uh, and, and, and including the thin sections of, of frozen material that he was very keen on. But um, this paper here, uh, this review, Quarter Reviews of Biophysics 1988 and the papers that were referred to in that going back to 1980, 1982, uh, Dubochet and his colleagues, um, Mark Adrian and um, Alistair McDowell they were the ones who, uh, with support from John Kendrew and the, the very fledgling EMBL lab, as it was then in Heidelberg, they were the ones who spent years studying the behavior of water, how it freezes, how it diffracts, how it changes from amorphous ice to cubic ice and hexagonal ice, and as a basis for embedding single particles without any crystals and, and getting really nice images. So this review in 1988 has dozens of really beautiful images showing the power of the method. Although it wasn't able to deliver the structures at high resolution then, you could tell that this was really the way everything was going to, to go. And then soon after that, uh, many other people started to do cryo-EM rather than just normal EM. And what this shows is the apparatus they developed. This is a pair of forceps. In the middle, this is a three millimeter EM, typical EM grid. You put a drop of your solution on it, blot it, and then plunge it either under gravity or helped by these elastic bands. You plunge it down into a little chamber with liquid ethane just above the temperature of liquid nitrogen. It freezes rapidly and you get uh, films, uh, thin films of amorphous ice in which the particles are embedded, just like were shown in all those uh, images in the panel that I just showed beforehand. And then, one of the many specimens that Jacques looked at was uh, adenovirus, which was the favorite specimen of the second director at the MBL, Leonard Philipson from Sweden, adenovirus. And you can see this is a, a thin film, adenovirus, blotted and plunge frozen. And you can see most of the viruses are really looking beautiful and they're nice and intact, although in this field of view, there, there's a completely broken one here, another broken one here, and then a couple where they're sort of beginning to break up here. So there's, there are four damaged viruses, but something like 20 really nice and intact ones. And this was on the front cover of Nature in 1984. And those of us who saw that and remember the time felt this is really is the beginning of a new field cryo-EM, which has now kind of reached really high levels of productivity so that it's appealing to many people who don't need to know very much about it. But it took about uh, seven years for images like this to be converted from just looking at them and saying how nice it is into a 3D model. And this was Phoebe Stewart, who was a postdoc with Steve Fuller in a different group at the MPL, who developed programs and procedures and images like this, which were taken on a 100 KB microscope without a field emission gun and without, with photographic film as the recording medium. So really quite old fashioned compared to today. But nevertheless, they got a 35 angstrom resolution structure and it's blurry and it's low resolution because the images are fuzzy and they're fuzzy because 
uh, the Fourier components in, that make up the image are fading in power compared to what they were before they were recorded. And, and these are described by a B factor, which is a sort of temperature factor, fading factor of 3000. And now we, we, we've got something like 100 times lower B factors, so much, much better resolution than you could get then. But this is how uh, the images by Dubochet's plunge freeze cryo EM looked like in the 1980s. And this was the sort of resolution you got uh, for many years. And for, for adenovirus, it stayed like this until 20 years later when Hong Chu, uh, UCLA, went back to work on it. And you can see this is now in a higher voltage microscope, 300 kV, with a much brighter source, field emission guns, 500 times brighter. But the image is still recorded on film. So the microscope and the hardware is better, but the recording medium is the same and the images are better. And when they process these images, so this is now 10 years ago, uh, this is the same image top left, this is the structure bottom left, and the resolution is now 3.6 angstrom resolution with a 10 times lower B factor. And you can see in the protein then, the extended polypeptide, this is a, a bit of beta sheet structure and one strand of it with the side chains coming out. So you've gone from um, 35 to 3.6 actor, 10 times the resolution with a thousand times more Fourier components. So that was a big step forward, driven entirely by the microscope hardware. So the vacuum was good, the stages were good, uh, the, the, the uh, electron source was much brighter. And so all of the hardware improvements made, made, made that big, big difference. And in a way that's sort of how it stood um, until the um, new detectors came in, uh, which made better images than on film. And this is a, uh, a study that we made in Cambridge. Greg McMullen was the leader in that, comparing the detective quantum efficiency. When, and when that's, 100, when that's one or 100%, that means you're recording every electron that is forming the image without having any noise or any, any re reduction in that quality of the images. And if you get 100% detective quantum efficiency all the way across, that means not only you've recorded them, but you've found exactly where they fall. Whereas if they get fuzzy, you, you lose the detective quantum efficiency with the resolution. But if you compare it, film's about 30%, dropping to 10%. These three detectors in color, come from the three different companies, Direct Electron, um, now Thermo Fisher and Gatan, um, showing that the detective quantum efficiency, this was now 2014, maybe double that at low resolution and high resolution. And that factor of two, you thought factor of two doesn't really, shouldn't really make such a big difference. But these cameras also had uh, recording the images in movie mode, so you could, remove any blurring or charging that was happening during each exposure. So it might be a, say, a five second exposure and previously on film it would be blurry and that ruined the quality of the high resolution uh, features in the image. A bit like taking a picture of a racing car with slow film. You, know, you only see the blur, you know it's there but you can't see details. So the combination of the higher DQE and these movies uh, turned out to take you over the threshold and then the quality of the images became much better than they were um, back before. So I'm now going to show you just uh, five structures that I think give you um, an impression of the power of the method, uh, particularly. So the first one is um, it wasn't wasn't the first structure structure done of ribosomes with cryo EM, and lots of groups have worked on this, but this was. Alexi Amund's work when he was a postdoc, he's now a group leader in Stockholm, uh, coordinating their cryo-EM efforts, the development of, in, in Stockholm. He was working on the mitochondrial ribosome, trying to purify it and get 3D crystals for X-ray crystallography, working in the group of Venki Ramakrishnan. But um, he had noticed that the, the, the uh, EM methods were getting better, and he collaborated with a a postdoc in Shor Sherez group called Shaochen Bai, and Shaochen is now uh, a professor in Dallas in Texas. So the two postdocs, one an expert in ribosomes and one in the cryo-EM, 
uh, worked together and got images like this one on, on the top left. So in between the ribosomes, it's just the amorphous ice, just like in the method I showed you. Uh, and then these are pictures of ribosomes in different orientations. However, it also includes ribosomes that have fallen apart. So they've, they've separated from the intact uh, large plus small subunits. Some of them are large, some of them are small. And there's also about 20% cytoplasmic ribosome impurities. And of course that you can't really imagine you'd ever, you'd ever, ever be able to crystallize that. And indeed he was unable to, but um, uh, Alexi and Xiao Chen analyzed images like this and without doing any selection, got this sort of low resolution, sort of 10, 15 angstrom resolution structure. But one of the big power of the cryo-EM method came from software developments. And George Cherez, who had been um, a postdoc in Madrid for six or seven years, working with uh, Jose Carrazzo on the XMIP software system for cryo-EM, was recruited as a, a group leader here in Cambridge at LMB and wrote a new software that used maximum likelihood, maximum entropy methods to get better signal to noise ratios and so on. He wrote, spent two years, 2010 to 2012, writing rely on. And one of the features he included was one that he'd worked on earlier, which was classification systems, 2D and 3D classifications. And so you can say, I would like the computer program to take all those single particle images and uh, try to classify them. And, and here they picked six classes. And after cycling a few times, each image is then compared to each of the six developing 3D models. And eventually they sort themselves out almost by magic really. And what you can see is they've got four classes that involve mitochondrial ribosome assemblies. Two of them have the intact uh, large and small subunit, but two others are mainly the large subunit, possibly with a few that have sneaked in. So it's basically the large subunit, the whole ribosome, and then here's cytoplasmic ribosomes from um, BFART mitochondria and um, some that they didn't know quite what it was. And then another feature that's in Relyon and in other softwares now is that when you're trying to find the orientation, the position and orientation of one of these particles, you can ask the computer program to focus not on the whole structure, but you can focus only on the part you, you, you think might be best preserved. So for example, the large subunit, you do focused uh, orientational refinement. And when you do that, you get a more accurate high resolution map of the part you focused on. And then in the same data set, you can say, I'm going to look at the small subunit now, focus on that and get a sharp picture. So even though the structure might be flexible, um, you can get images uh, of the different parts of it uh, in the computer after you've collected. So one data set and multiple structures. And then by looking at that, they were able to find, build a complete model of all the proteins and the RNAs in this mitochondrial ribosome. And there were a lot of new ones that hadn't been seen in any other ribosome before. So when you look at parts of it, you see things like this. So this is a little bit of the paper they published in 2014, uh, a little bit of uh, Watson Crick RNA double helix with the base pairs and a top view here with Watson Crick base pair, uh, an alpha helix with side chains uh, and two loops in the structure with a, what they believe to be a magnesium ion and some side chains here. So when you look at this density, if you've got experience as from X-ray crystallography, you, 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 you can agree that the resolution probably is roughly the 3.1 angstrom resolution that, that it was claimed to be by the computer program. So this is a very good example. Impure specimen, uh, not uh, structurally homogeneous and having multi flexible states from the ratcheting of the ribosomes. All this can be separated out later in the computer. And so I think this one study uh, shows a lot about the power of the cryo methodology. And a second one comes from Kiyoshi Nagai's group. And Kiyoshi Nagai had worked since 1990. He'd, he'd, he'd been a postdoc working on hemoglobin. He switched to working on splicing in 1990. But unfortunately, a year ago, um, he developed uh, liver cancer and died. So his group is still working. Um, but his student, Kelly Nguyen, who had done a PhD in Kiyoshi's group doing X-ray crystallography, she had also noticed, um, like Alexi, that um, 
the cry UEM methods were getting more powerful. So she was the one who led Kiyoshi's group into doing the cry UEM. And this is the, the first spliceosome, uh, let's say macromolecular assembly structure, U456, the trisnerp, initially at 3.7 angstroms with a lot of this focused refinement because it's very flexible structure. But in the end, they were able to find out and build atomic models of all the different subunits. A few of them had been crystallized separately and solved by X-ray crystallography. So they were helped by other, other structures. And so that's a very, another example with a much more flexible structure. And now uh, Kiyoshi Nagai's group and then other groups, for example, um, Holger Stark in Göttingen and uh, Yi Gong Shi in, in China, there are many others have worked on splicing and there are now other structures all, also done by, by cry UEM. And, and, and in Nagai's group now they've done many, many structures of the different intermediate states, different complexes in the spliceosome reaction. So the cry UEM has made a very big difference in uh, understanding the molecular mechanisms underlying splicing. And the people who discovered splicing 30 years ago, um, you know, they, they are absolutely delighted that, uh, you know, mechanisms and procedures that they, they, they knew biochemical reactions they knew could happen. Now there's a, a molecular basis for understanding them. And here's a little bit of um, that original map. And of course now they've got much better maps, 2.5 angstrom resolution so on now than they had, but that's a little bit of um, RNA double helix at the top and single-stranded RNA helix at the bottom, and then an alpha helix from the protein PRP3. So that's now uh, an even more challenging specimen that of course you couldn't imagine doing by any other method. And then a third one is um, a membrane protein complex, which is also from mitochondria called mitochondrial complex one. And this was brought over from a group that had been working on uh, the biochemistry of mitochondrial complex one, Judy Hurst's group. And Judy Hurst is now the director of the MRC mitochondrial biology unit in Cambridge, but she brought this sample over about 2014. And uh, in, in our group, um, Vinoth Kumar took this picture. Uh, Xiaopeng Zhu in Judy's group made the purified protein. And he, Shai Pen had been trying to crystallize it to make 3D crystals and had made crystals, but they only diffracted to 10 angstrom, so that never went any further. But within a, a month or two, um, the Vinoth and Shai Pen had got this structure, uh, five angstrom structure of the mitochondrial complex one, which has uh, 76 transmembrane helices, and then contoured at a higher level, eight iron sulfur complexes, and the way that this mitochondrial complex one works in terms of its mechanism is uh, redox energy is fed in at the top through NA NADH, and it reduces this chain of iron sulfur complexes down to the quinone in the membrane. And then the reduction of, the, of this quinone in the membrane triggers a structural change uh, that pumps three or four protons through the membrane protein channels, creates the electrochemical gradient that can make ATP and allow the the mitochondria to, to generate energy. And at a lower contour level, this is the, um, the, the belt of, of lipid and detergent that's used to extract the protein uh, from the mitochondrial membrane. And then they went on about a year later, um, they got a higher resolution structure, about four angstroms, and were able to build a complete atomic model of all 45 polypeptide chains that make up that uh, one mega Dalton complex. And in the blue behind the, the, the core of the, of the molecule, there were bacterial homologs. So there was a thermophilic bacterial homolog of mitochondrial complex one, about half the molecular weight, 500 kilodaltons. And Leo Sasanoff, who was also in that same uh, MRC mitochondrial unit had solved that by crystallizing um, the core, the 16 core subunits of the thermophilic um, bacterial uh, version of complex one. And that did help them in the, in the beginning to do the interpretation. But now Judy's group and Leo's group now in Vienna are well advanced on many different species, many different multiple states. So a lot more work than I'm showing you here has been done. And other groups, Werner Kohlbrandt's group, uh, there's several groups in, in Tsinghua who work on mitochondrial complex one. So again, the cryo has revolutionized our understanding. And there are even super complexes 
of complex one with complex three and complex four, all analyzed by, by crime, often in mixed states, sorted out by the classification methods that I mentioned. So I'm gonna show just two more. Uh, one was that uh, there is a limit to the size of structures you can do. Once they get too small, uh, you can see in these images here, there's a certain noise level. And once the structure gets too small, you can't really tell the difference between noise in the amorphous ice and the, and the particle. And, and we thought that limit was about 50 or 60 kilodaltons. But a student in Martin's Reed called Miriam Koshai, who now works for Novartis in Switzerland, she decided this is in the Martin's Reed Max Planck uh, Center, which is better known for their work in, in tomography. But Miriam was a student with Radiston Danef. And she was the one again. So a lot of student-led work in CryoM uh, took images using the faceplate that Danef had developed, which gives you a slight advantage at lower resolution. This is an image of human hemoglobin, which they bought from Sigma, uh, imaged in CryoEM uh, over a weekend. And here are their 2D classes. And here is their 3D model on the bottom right. Uh, it's about three and a half angstrom resolution. Here is the heme group and the uh, distal and proximal histidines that you find in hemoglobin and an alpha and alpha helix. So you can go all the way from hemoglobin way up to ribosomes and, and uh, coccidioviruses, all with essentially the same methodology and the same hardware. And then one last one I'd, I'd show, I thought I'd show is, of course, the pharmaceutical companies have also developed an interest in solving their structures, the ones that they couldn't solve by making crystals by cryoEM. And in Cambridge, this company Astex here, about four years ago, uh, Haran Jyoti, who was the CEO of Astex, he was visiting uh, LMB talking to David Barford about some other project. And he came and said, well, you know, they've been wondering, should they get into cryo EM? And he persuaded five of his colleagues in other companies and they funded the purchase and running of one uh, Thermo Fisher Creos around about 2016 as a pilot to see whether it was going to be useful. And now they have that same consortium of five companies has two Creoses. Astex itself have bought two more. Um, all the other companies have also bought them. You know, there was PSK, AstraZeneca, uh, UCB Pharma and so on. They're all heavily involved in it now. But they, this is one of the first papers they published, which is about a year ago, Drug Discovery Today. What they did is they took a test protein, which was they decided to pick beta galactosidase from E. coli, uh, which is the structure at the top left. It's about two angstrom resolution. Actually, Sriram Subramaniam's work, he led the way in uh, studying uh, beta galactosidase as a structure. And they've got that now at about 1.8 angstrom resolution. But here, they're, what they're doing is they're soaking in a ligand, either a substrate or an inhibitor, collecting data for one day, and then calculating a structure, usually at about, in this paper it describes it, about 2.4 angstroms. And they collected something like 60 data sets, which took 60 days of different compounds. And in this paper, they're showing um, three of the ligands that are bound. So in the middle is the ligand, uh, in the middle in the active site, you know, and beta lactosidase cleaves lactose into two glucoses in, in the metabolic E. coli. But they also studied pyruvate kinase with two different compounds bound. So you can see that structure-based drug design can be done. Uh, and this, this is their, their conclusion. They said in their paper, they demonstrate that not only can you get details of the molecular interaction, but you can, with the current state of the art, they can also do what, what they, they focus on is fragment-based drug design. These are little fragments, but you can also do complete substrates or, or complexes and so on. So those five structures then are meant to give you a good idea of where we are in terms of the general uh, level of a, examples of achievement. But what about the field as a whole? Um, so if I go here, if we look now in the protein data bank, and I looked about a week ago now, uh, to see how uh, uh, structural biology was developing. And there are 175,000 sets of coordinates deposited. Almost all of them are done by extra crystallography. And the graph on the left 
shows the growth in annual depositions using X-ray crystallography. It's up to about 10 or 11,000. And red was NMR, which in the early, well, 20 years ago was quite popular, particularly for structures you couldn't crystallize, zinc fingers and things like that. But for de novo structure determinations, NMR peaked 2007, and now it's really declining and is used mainly for low affinity ligand binding studies, which the pharmaceutical industry is very keen on. So it's still very useful, but not for de novo structure determinations. Whereas the cryo-EM, you can see there was nothing here. And now it's growing, uh, it is growing exponentially. So say, let's say in 1998, there were perhaps two structures good enough, usually to dock in a model. For example, one of them might've been that hepatitis B that I showed you. So, but it's grown and grown and grown. And one of the ways, so now it's about a quarter of the structures done by X-ray that's roughly speaking the number, you know, a quarter or a fifth. So the, the one uh, way we like to compare it to kind of estimate how much money to put into the different fields and what you should be buying, have you bought enough microscopes and so on, is to look at the ratio of, uh, of X-ray uh, to EM. And, and you can see in this um, graph that before the year 2000, uh, which is be before we really had the field emission guns, for every um, thousand X-ray structures, there was just one uh, done by cryo-EM. And then the microscopes got better, the hardware, the vacuum, the brightness of the sources. So it was down to about one in a hundred. The detectors came in around about 2012 to 2013. And you can see from then on, it is more or less a straight line. This is on a log scale. Uh, so it really started to take off. And so then, um, We've, we've drawn this dotted line and you can see the, the two last points. This one was for the year 2020 and this was for the first three months of this year. So you can see it's still going on down. And if you extrapolate, it, it should be roughly equal. Um, so um, in about, uh, let's say this is made in, in about three years time. So that's how things are going in general. But of course, many of the structures being done by CryoEM cannot be done by X-ray. And many of the structures done by X-ray are so quick with multiple ligands and so on that you wouldn't think of doing it. So the methods are quite complementary and quite useful in different ways. So before I go on and, and tell you a little bit about tomography and where we're going, I thought I'd throw in two very recent uh, new-ish uh, new achievements that uh, the CryEM have done. And I, like, I particularly like this, um, this paper, which was which was published in, um, let me, I have to move my things off the screen. <laughs> Hang on, um, so I can read it. It was a, to about two years ago in in BioArchive, and it's the Adeno associated virus. So it's a coccidiovirus, and the thing that I like about this this was the first the very first structure that went to high enough resolution that the curvature of the Evolt sphere which is of course a fundamental consideration in extra crystallography, but it had never been, the resolution of the maps was never high enough uh, using cryo -EM for the Evolt sphere curvature to matter. So what uh, Dimitri uh, Lyumkus and his group at the Salk Institute found was they got, they, they listened to all the things you should do and they took all the precautions and they got a 1.9 angstrom resolution structure of the, of the Icosipro virus particle. And by putting in explicitly the correction for the fact that the diffracted beams have Evolt sphere curvature into their map, they were able to reduce the B factor from a B factor of 60, remember compared to 3000 in 1991, from 60 to 50. And these lines show you how you get higher resolution with fewer particles. And then the resolution, it's not much in terms of you know, 1.93 to 1.86, but it really is clear and it really is significant. And these are the, what some of the densities for the side chains look like. So the aromatics have little holes in the middle. So that's really nice. And then the current record for resolution from the single particle prime comes from work, actually several groups have done structures for apoferritin, which of course has the advantage, it's got 24 subunits. And so you see in this field of view here, you've probably got about four or 500 particles and each particle has 24 subunits in it. 
So you've got something like maybe five or 10,000 um, images. So actually from this one image, you can get a pretty good structure, you know, 2.9 or three actons, so one image because it's got such a high symmetry. But if you put a lot of images in, you can push the resolution and they have 1.2 angstrom resolution from that. And, um, you know, you can see hydrogen atoms and things like that. So these are two of the, um, and of course you needed many more, you need to correct for beam tilt, you need higher order cor corrections. Um, but most people interested in structural biology will be perfectly happy with two and a half or three angstrom resolution. So, uh, that's kind of a, a bit of an overview where we are with single particle cryo EM. Um, I thought I ought to, in, in a talk, I ought to put in two slides about uh, electron cryotomography. So this one comes from a paper uh, in 2002 from Ohad Medalia, who is now a group leader in Switzerland, but he was a, a postdoc with Wolfgang Baumeister's group in Martinsried. And of course they've put most effort of anybody into electron cryotomography. And this was, uh, they were able to identify membranes, which are in blue, uh, the actin filaments in this case, which are in brown. And then I think the, um, the, uh, the yellow ones mostly are, are um, ribosomes. It says green here, but the yellow on my screen. And that's how it was 20 years ago. But the methods have improved, the detectors, the microscopes, the drift corrections, phase plates, and so on. And so now this is a recent paper, uh, 2020 now, uh, from um, Julia Mahamids, who's now a group leader at EMBL, but she, this was done while she was at, at Martin's Reed. And this is really a very, very high quality um, electron cryotomography section. And you can see again, they've, they've identified many of the features, um, the actin, the microtubules, and now the ribosomes, instead of being a sort of shape, shapeless or slightly shaped green, they've, they've now got the identification of the large and small subunits of the ribosomes. And actually you can also, you can identify which state there are they? Are they in a ratcheted state? Or are they bound to transmembrane translocons? And then in the purple and pink, it's the nuclear pore uh, subunits. And again, by averaging uh, 3D regions of these tomograms, you can do subtomogram averaging, just like the single particle EM, but from tomograms, and get structures for the ribosomes, for the uh, the nuclear pores, for the actin, and so on. So really. The method is developing well and it's got a long, long way to go. So this is really a great time to invest in uh, new equipment and new technology for electron crime microscopy, whether you're doing single particle work or, uh, or tomography. Okay, so then um, I'd like to sort of round off um, the, the, the content of what I'm telling you about today in this, in this lecture by telling you uh, a little bit about how we've been thinking uh, in terms of what we need for the future. And this was driven by the fact that 10 years ago in the LMB here in Cambridge, where we had a long tradition in electron microscopy, electron cry microscopy, uh, there were only maybe 10 or 15 people doing cry UEM. We could walk up to the microscope every day and use it. And then we got the new microscopes, the new detectors, the new software, and suddenly it became a lot easier. And so lots of people who had no background in CryEM wanted to get involved. And so we found that first the booking sheets got longer and longer and longer and we bought more microscopes. And now the, the, you know, the, the, the most popular microscope, you have to wait eight weeks to get one day on it. And then our rules are you can only book on one of the high-end microscopes and not on all of them. So actually now there are hundreds of people in the lab alongside their other work, they're doing cryo-EM as well. So, it's, so what we said is that we really must have our own microscope. And of course, it's difficult to justify one group spending 5 million and then not letting anybody else use it. So what we said is, and that's shown in this slide, Binoth Kumar and I wrote this review about four years ago trying to look forward. It was a, a section of the review called the need for affordable cryo-EM. 
And we said that there are various ways of going forward. Obviously, you can have national or international facilities like at ESRF or at EMBL or at Diamond or in America, they have now three national centers and you can go there. But in order to go there, you need to make sure your specimen's good and make good grids. Otherwise, they won't let you come. So you require preferably daily access to cryam to get your specimens to work out. And if it's a smaller structure, you can't really see anything much about it unless you have a field emission coherent bright source. So below about 150 to 200 kilodons, you can't really even see what you're doing. So we said, okay, you need, um, you need field emission and you need to be inexpensive. And, and you need that for, diagnose, for diagnosing what's wrong with your sample. That's what we need. Even though we're, you know, we have a lot of experience, we still need to be able to look at our samples. Otherwise, you're just, you might as well go on holiday. So what we said is that there's a desperate need for an inexpensive diagnostic cryo-M. And our idea was it should be a 100 kV microscope with a field emission gun. And then somebody needs to develop a, a detector that works well at, at 100 kV. And that's originally, that's what we said. We just wanted a cheap one. Needn't be quite as good. But what we did is we got involved in thinking about what is the impact? Will it be worse or will it be better at 100 kV? So Chris Russo and I got involved with uh, evaluating the cross sections and the radiation damage at different accelerating voltages, different electron energies. And Matthew Peet, who is a postdoc in Chris Russo's group, um, spent quite a long time measuring the inelastic and the elastic cross section. And they, you know, obviously he did it on, on graphene, but we also measured, and I'm not showing that, we've also measured radiation damage to 2D crystals like bacteria rhodopsin, like aquaporin, like paraffin, straight chain paraffins. And, and so we now know that the radiation damage is pretty much parallel to the inelastic scattering cross section. And the high resolution Fourier components of the image is proportional to the elastic. And so you can work out how much information you get from your images by looking at the ratio of elastic to inelastic scattering. And you can see from this graph, it's a log scale here, and this is the energy. You can see it gets better at lower energy because the inelastic cross section goes up at lower energy, but the elastic cross section goes up faster. But of course, Specimens have to be a certain thickness, and so there's a certain amount of uh, electrons are lost by scattering. So the amount of transmitted is e to the minus thickness over the mean free path, lambda. And lambda is about 3,000 angstroms at 300 kV and probably 1,500 angstroms at, at, at 100 kV. So these um, da dashed lines here are the multiplication is transmission times elastic divided by an elastic. And what you can see is as you come from very high energy down in energy, it gets better and better and better. And if your specimen's a thousand angstroms thick, you start to lose electrons uh, when you get below 300 keV. So for specimens that are a thousand angstroms or thicker, you're better off at 300 keV. But if your specimen's only 300 angstroms, and almost everything in cryo-EM is actually less than 300 angstroms. So ribosomes, they're about 240 angstroms thick, and all these little proteins, less than a megadol, they're much smaller than that. So that, that peaks, 300 angstroms of ice peaks at 100 kB. And then if you can go thinner, you could go a bit lower. So our idea is then that 100 kB not only should be cheaper, but it will also give you better images with more information than at 300 kB. You'll still need 300 kB because it's slightly better at thicker specimens, so for, for tomography, but actually almost everything you can do will work perfectly well. And, and even if you wanted to work on a big virus, the fact that you get a slight improvement if you, as you go from 100 kB um, to, um, to you get a slight loss as you go to thicker specimens, it doesn't matter because these big viruses are so overdetermined in their in, in their tomography. Anyway, so that was the theory. So we said we said in theory, 100 kV should be better. What about in practice? So in this second paper, this is Katerina Naidanova, who's a PhD student with Chris Russo, and this paper was published about a year ago. We had about five or six specimens. We took images, and this is 
uh, the E. coli DPS protein. And this is an image taken on a very small detector. So this detector is 500 pixels by 1,000 pixels. And we took a few hundred images in a few hours and got this 3.5 angstrom resolution structure of this DPS structure. And actually, I, I know that there's a work on, on Dinococcus radiodurans on DPS 1 and 2 also in Portugal. So, you know, this is a good one to practice on. And, 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 and looking forward, we're going to continue using this as we try to develop the 100 KB hardware to make it, uh, to make it better. So I, I'm just going to show you now uh, two, uh, let's say, paths forward for how uh, it might be possible for the different companies to produce 100 kV cryo EM that will not be as expensive as the um, as the Creos or the or the JL cryo arm. So one of them uh, was announced by Thermo Fisher in November. And we had tried to persuade them to do this five years ago, and they said no. But after these papers were published, I think they realized they must do it. So they've, they've launched this, and you can order one now. As of the 18th of November, you could place an order, and it will probably be delivered early in 2022. And the idea is it'll be only 100 KB, and it won't have a very good detector on it, and it will only do one grid at a time, but it'll allow you to do analyses, screening, and preliminary structure work. And so, um, you know, we are, we've expressed an interest in this and we've said we are willing to become a beta test site for it. And they're hoping to have that maybe later in the year as a prototype and then deliver it early, early next year. And then the other one, we got together with JL, and this is our um, in-house project to demonstrate how anybody else who wants to can start to think about doing 100 kV cryo EM less expensively. And in the end, we applied and got a grant from the Wellcome Trust. And so we've actually bought three of these columns. This is a JL 1400 column, which was about 200,000 pounds. And it came without, a, it doesn't have a field emission gun and it didn't have a detector when it arrived. But we've bought this detector from Dectris called the Singler. It has a one megapixel area. So it's twice as big as the detector we used for that DPS work. And this is on our microscope now. And this is an image on the screen being taken by this detector at 100 kV. And quite soon from this company, your probe sources, within a month or two, we're hoping to have a field emission gun here. So we will have a bright, coherent field emission gun we'll have one or other of these three cold stages, which we've also bought. This is Simple Origin, Fishioni, and the Catan Elsa. And all of them fit into this microscope. They're all uh, gel uh, versions of the cold stage. You can get Thermo Fisher versions and so on. So we're heavily involved in this and we're hoping to be able to demonstrate this as a working system that anybody could buy. And obviously it'll, you need to buy a microscope, a field emission gun and the detector but JL are pretty much thinking of, um, being, of, of getting ready to take an order and then they would deliver the, the system by itself. So one way or another uh, with uh, a JL led um, collection of equipment or from um, the Thermo Fisher, there will be something uh, let's say in less than a year that might be quite useful for people who want to have daily access to microscopes. And then with time, of course, you can make bigger and better detectors and, and better cold stages and so on. So we think that's how it will, it will develop. Okay, so I think that was all of the things I wanted to tell you about. Uh, here are the acknowledgements now. So I've, I've picked, I haven't, I haven't um, focused much on things that, uh, that we've worked on, although we've been slightly involved in some of these, but I picked adenovirus because that was one of the earliest cryo -M, beautiful cryo -M pictures from Du Boucher and, and has a high resolution structure from Hong Cho. Uh, the mitochondrial ribosome uh, with Alexia Amuts now in, in, in Stockholm. Spicosome, um, Kelly Nguyen, when she was a first, just finished her PhD with Kiyoshi. She's now been recruited back as a group leader at the LMB. Mitochondrial complex one, 
Uh, Vinoth is now in Bangalore leading the cryo EM in India. In, in, uh, hemoglobin was Miriam Koshai, who was a student now at Novartis. Um, April Ferriton was led by in Shaw Scherer's groups here. It was collaboration with Thermo Fisher with, with a cold field emitter and things like this. And this is um, Takanori um, Nagani, who is uh, heavily involved in Rely On. And if you subscribe to the CCPEM mailing list, you'll see that um, he is the one who answers many of the questions about um, rely on. And then beta galactosides and structure-based drug design came from um, Saur et al, published in that uh, chemistry today, Harry Jyoti and, and Paolo Williams, showing that the, uh, the pharma companies are doing this. And then these two um, structures, um, oh, I've got apoferritin in there twice, sorry. <laughs> um, cryotomography was all from, led from, um, from uh, Martin's read, but Ohed Medalia is in Zurich and Julia Mahamed is now a group leader at EMBL. And then all of our, we're still working a lot on detectors actually, 300 KB and 100 KB, half a dozen different projects. Uh, Greg McMullen and Wazi Faruqi uh, is, is our team here who works on that. Renato Turchetto now has a commercial company in Barcelona doing detector design and Nicola Garini is leading the work at at RAL, which is right next to Diamond in the UK. And then all this 100 kV cryo EM 100 project, both the demonstration and trying to deliver it up to the stage when the companies should then do it as a product uh, is, is sort of led in, in um, Chris Russo's group. Okay, so with that then, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, I'm happy to have questions. Okay, so thank you so much, Professor Henderson. Uh, a great and captivating talk as usual, thank you. We already have a couple of questions in the Q&A. However, I would like to, 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 to start with the first uh, question. So looking at the, um, at the slides that you compare the, the, the catch-up growth between cryo-EM and, and crystallography, uh, you pointed the, the, the equivalence point at mid-2024. Uh, but Well, we know that uh, some, some countries like, for instance, Portugal, are trying to democratize the access to, to cryo-EM funding these facilities. And also know the, the, the effort that you are putting into the, the microscope that you are developing with GEO. Do you think that this... Um, easier access to, 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 high, to, to, to microscopes will uh, make that, that provision of mid-2024 earlier? Or do you think that there, are, there will be still some other uh, issues that will um, always be, be around uh, trying to, to uh, and not making that, that deadline to be earlier? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's accelerating actually, because you know if you look at it, it's been it's that that dotted line on the log curve. It's pretty much straight, and so um, and also the numbers were quite small, uh, you know, five or six years ago. So it is doubling about every eighteen to twenty months, and so it only has to double twice more to to be on par with X-ray crystallography, and so I think there are still lots of places buying these microscopes. And, you know, in, in when they were first selling, for example, Thermo Fisher, we bought a microscope in 2007 in Cambridge and they offered us a Creos. And we looked into it and we said, no, no, it's not ready. It's too, uh, it's, it's got problems. And we bought a Polara. And the people who bought Creoses in 2007, 2008, they didn't get anything out of them for five years till the detectors came. So you don't want to go too early, but now they were making you know, two a year and then 10 a year, they're now making 50 a year. But if you extrapolate, uh, you know, they cost a lot of money. And I think that various people who've estimated it think that the, the 300 KB market will saturate at about three or 400 microscopes worldwide. But these 100 kV ones, we think they're going to be about uh, five or 10 times cheaper. And so I think it's possible 
that there'll be more 100 kb cryo-EM microscopes in 2030 than there are 300 kb uh, cryo microscopes because all of the methodology that's involved could be improved to be optimized. So for example, we do not have a good detector at 100 kb at the moment. The singular is the best. And there is only, we have the only one in the world that's been delivered. And they're building two more. And I think we're going to buy the second one as well. Um, so, you know, the, and, but, and there are other groups trying to develop bigger detectors, but the, the work to develop the 300 kb detectors I mean, we started, we were working in 2002 with Turchetta and, and, and Garini, and it took 10 years before these, so this hardware development just takes a very, very long time. So I don't think, I think the next two years is completely predictable, but after that, it will plateau unless we get the 100 KB microscopes. Uh, you will still, you can't continue to do exponential growth indefinitely, but Another reason that we're fairly confident that that extrapolation will work is that if you look at just papers published by MRC Molecular Biology Lab, and if you remember, you know, there was the Kendrew myoglobe and that was, and that was in the early LMB. So we're not, uh, you know, we are, th this lab, I, I was an X-ray crystallographer as well. We are not um, dragging our feet to do X-ray crystallography. But if you look at pub, protein coordinate depositions comparing cryo-EM with extra crystallography here in LMB. And we have much bigger resources for X-ray. We have crystallization rooms, robots, everything for doing extra crystallography because that was what we thought was going to be the future 15 years ago. But in LMB, the cryo-EM overtook X-ray coordinate depositions about three or four years ago. So we're already Two or three times ahead, so that 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 line, LMB alone, we have exactly the same slope, but it's it's moved by about five years uh, earlier, and also if rather than picking on one lab, if you pick membrane proteins, uh, you know there's a lot of very difficult to crystallize membrane proteins. Uh, membrane proteins is also just as a category worldwide. Membrane proteins by cryo-EM already overtook uh, X-ray coordinate depositions uh, for membrane proteins. So I don't think there's any doubt in the short term. And then the long term, it does depend on putting investments. You know, how do, how do you persuade people to put money into hardware developments? Because unless you do that, the hardware will never exist. And so I think that's a key factor. So say beyond 2025 depends very much on how much money JL and Thermo Fisher put into the development of the inexpensive cryo-EM because that will help the number of people who have specimens. It'll make much better use of the high-end microscopes and then it'll go on having exponential growth. And one of the reasons we haven't, you know, we, we feel we must continue here because it's very tempting for the companies to say, oh, we don't have a microscope. You have to buy the Cryo-EM 100 or 200 or the Glacios or the, or the Cryos because that's what we sell. So I think it needs pressure from the users. And, and obviously they, they themselves, they don't know yet uh, how many people will order a Tundra or if JL announced that you can buy this one that we've been working on. Uh, how many, but as far as I know, there are zero orders at the moment. So, you know, Portugal could be the first. So. Yes, and, 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 like, and, and like, like you've said, even with, thinking the, the example of Portugal, even with the central nodes in the north of the country, you will always need these types of um, entry level microscopes to help you in the day to day because access to the high end microscopes are not, are not easy. Yeah. So I will ask I will ask Anna to unmute uh, Sharon Wolf. Uh, she has a question. And right. she, so Sharon, please go ahead. Hi Richard, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, very good, Sharon. Okay. So uh, Richard, uh, I I wanted to ask first of all about uh, cryo uh, tomography. So indeed, for cryo tomography, I think I'm not sure you mentioned it, but indeed, higher voltage is and always will be an advantage. It is, yeah. 
And my question about cryotomography is if you believe that the future of cryotomography, not only for septimal gram average, but also for bringing together the cell biology and structural biology communities uh, and the need for morphological um, development of morphological tomography that, 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 that looks at samples that have better preservation than what you get from high pressure freezing and free substitution. And then, so I was, I wanted to ask you to comment on that, the, the future to, for tomography for a cell biologist as well as structural. And then the other question is, from what I understand, the Joel, there is a chance that the Joel will be delivered shortly with a camera that could also offer data collection, something like the Detrix, or will that also just be a screening microscope with a FIG at 100 kilovolts? Okay, so that's two questions. So one, uh, on tomography, you know, the, the difference between 100 and 300 in terms of mean free part, it, it is a factor of two. So let's say you think that at 300 kV, you're limited to specimens, you know, for a certain quality. Let's say you said uh, 400 nanometer thick specimen. You'd get the same quality uh, at 100 kV with a 200 nanometer thick specimen. And I, I know that, for example, Peter Rosenthal published a paper without a field emission gun and without a good detector doing tomography on some influenza project um, at Mill Hill before he was at the Crick. And they had really pretty looking tomography uh, specimens. Uh, so I'd say, you know, there is, there's always going to be an advantage, particularly, the, and the thicker you go, and, and if you go to very thick microns, then you need, um, you know, your, your type of uh, cryo stem rather than, uh, you know, phase contrast imaging. So, yeah, um, but coming back to the, the 100 kb one, be, because we have focused so strongly on the single particle cryo EM, the project we're doing uh, has, we've emphasized trying to get to high resolution. So we've bought these gel microscopes, the 1400s. We bought it with a high resolution pole piece. So see chromatic aberration 1.8 millimeters. And we did that so that we, we think with a field emission gun, we should be able to get to two angstrom resolution um, rather than um, let's say three angstroms or so with, but if you wanted to do tomography, you can, you can buy the JL 1400 with the high contrast 3.3 uh, millimeter or so chromatic aberration. And then you can't get to such high resolution, but you could do tomography with tilting specimens and so on. Uh, and of course, you know, you might not want to get beyond four or five angstroms anyway with tomography. You'd be quite happy and you could do, um, you know, subtomogram averaging. So there will be options with the 100 kV uh, project to do let's say not quite such good tomography, but you could explore your specimen, get somewhere with it, and then go to a regional center to do, to do better with that. So I think the cell biologists might well find that um, these more entry level microscopes could do quite well with tomography, but eventually you'll probably still want to go, and you know, there's still a way to go with, with the 300 kV uh, tomography. The, the detectors could be faster, uh, people talking about having having detectors with 10,000 frames per second, so you can just do continuous rotation and get your tomogram in five seconds or something like that, instead of in, in minutes or hours. Um, and then, um, what was the second question again now was the... Um, I was asking if the Joel machine uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future yeah. Also be offered with the Dectra so that so that this entry level dream of yours is really within the horizon of, of some months. Yeah. So um, yes, I mean gel do not the difference between Thermo Fisher and gel is that Thermo Fisher, uh, even though originally and even now, they are happy to install, you know, third party, if you like, detectors like the Gatan ones. I mean, they had their Eagle and they have the Ceta and, and now they have the Falcon and so on and so on. Um, but JL have never had their own detector. So if you buy a JL microscope and over the last 30 years and looking forward, you, you have to have a detector that comes from a, a, a different company. The only company you can't get it from is from Thermo Fisher. 
Um, so uh, at the moment, JL will be delighted to put a singular on your microscope. Um, and uh, actually I have to say the ones we use, they had, um, they, most of them had, a, had Gatan, Arias, or US 1000, or uh, other phosphor fiber optic detectors on it. Um, but, but looking forward, the, the, the hope is that JL, and we deal with JL UK, but JL UK have to talk to JL in Japan. The hope is that they will agree once this is all working and, and is shown to be a desirable thing, that you will be able to go as a customer to JL and say, I want a JL 1400. They may call it by a different name uh, with a field emission gun on it and um, let's say a dextrous detector on it. And then they, then they would handle everything and then they would deliver it and service it and their engineers would come and fix it if it was wrong. So I think it's all, you know, likely to work out. It's, it's possible, but it's not there yet. And, and even the Tundra, you know, their Thermo Fisher are going to deliver to two or three labs and see how it goes. Um, and they won't continue it unless they get a lot of orders for it. So in the end, it'll depend on the users looking into it, evaluating it, and deciding that this is how they're this is the direction they're going to take, rather than you know in X-ray labs, for example, now there is only one rotating anode X-ray set here in Cambridge in the UK, in our lab, and it's not very heavily used, and so all X-ray work is now done at synchrotrons. So you could imagine. Uh, the scenario when essentially all cryo EM would be done uh, at national centers. But because of the need to optimize, because of the need to, you have to look at your grid, whereas with crystals, you can look with an optical microscope and then mount them and then go and see, you know, with a screening session uh, for an hour at a synchrotron. For cryo EM, it is really very helpful. So I think it'll be a distributed system. There'll be national centers and then there'll be big universities, bigger institutions that have their own facilities. And then everybody will have the low end microscopes because everybody, big institutions, small institutions, small country, big, they all have to do the early preparation work. Thank you. Okay, so we have two more questions here related to the, to the equipment. The first one is, um, what software do you use to collect the data on your um, built microscope? And uh, what's the opinion on the ease of use and learning curve for cryo holders? Yeah. So um, at the moment, other people who use gel microscopes do not use the Thermo Fisher software EPU. They use either Serial EM or Legionon. And JL seem very happy with Serial EM, although that's David Mastronardi. It's not really commercial, you know, it depends on one person. Um, so our plan here in Cambridge is uh, because we have worked for many, many years, you know, like 15 or on different detectors, 300 kV, 100 kV. We have some uh, homemade graphical user interface software that Greg McMullen has written. So we have um, uh, a separate standalone computer that Greg has configured. And so for example, the Singla now is being controlled uh, via Greg's computer with Dectris hardware to control it, but the the image that comes out of the Singler, uh, which goes to the Dectris software, that is ignored. Essentially, that goes down the drain and we ignore it. It's, it's, it's on an optical fiber and you have a T-junction on the optical fiber. So Greg simply takes a passive feed and he does all the electron counting, centroiding, subpixel localization, uh, super resolution. And then that goes into his uh, movie and gets written to disk. And then it's on his computer on the screen. So at the moment, what we do is we do search focus image uh, by pressing the, um, the mouse 
on the gel microscope. And then once we're um, ready to take the picture, you do record the image with the other mouse. So you have two mice, and you, but you only press the one on the detector computer when you're recording the image. The beam is, the beam is blanked by the, the detector computer because that's just one wire or one optical fiber that goes into the other. So we think that can be used uh, on the jail or if there are any other detectors that come along because we have, we have a couple of other projects with other people. They will all be controlled by this standalone Greg McMullen software, which will be freely available. You know, you, you, you can just um, do it. So I, we don't think there's gonna be, the, the main thing will be if, if people are interested we're hoping later in the year, maybe six months from now, um, they'll be able to come and see it, perhaps put their specimen in and correct some data. And the side entry cold stages, that's what we've used since 1985. I mean, Dubochet used, we still have one of the original side entry cold stages. We have about 15 of them actually, but the th these three that I showed you, the ones in the black, blue and orange, they're, we just bought those. They're about 50 or 60,000 pounds each. And they are much better than they were 30 years ago. So they're stable. The, the Gatan Elsa, the hold time is nearly 12 hours. And the Gatan cold trap lasts about 12 hours as well. So in principle, you, you know, the vacuum isn't quite as good as it would be in the Glacios. So we, we, we're, we're thinking about uh, you put your grid in in the morning, you collect data for the day, and then you warm up the microscope overnight. That's the, the mechanism that we're thinking of doing. And uh, the idea would be one data set each day, one structure each day, just like you do at the moment. And so, but first, but we have to do it with all the components as they are, rather than the ones we were able to cobble together about a year ago. And so you'll be able to see that. Hopefully you'll be able to see a tundra and you can compare it to the Glacios and the Krios, and then you can make your own decision. Okay, thank you. We have one final question. So besides the improvement for FEGs and detectors, um, what do you think might be there still room for improvement regarding data processing and image processing? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of people now Picking particles seems to be the rate limiting step at the moment. And I have always liked to look at the images on the screen and pick the particles by hand, because then you know what you're doing. However, I know a lot of people cannot bother with that. They use one of a dozen different particle picking softwares. And there is now, um, the two that are most popular are something called Topaz and something called Cryolo, which I think comes from um, uh, Stephen Rouser and Dortmund and so on. Anyway, these are artificial intelligence type computer programs. They, they learn by interaction, you tell it what, it's got a, a complete data bank of particles from the past. And I have not used this myself but I'm told that it, it can work quite well. And then you, you pick your particles, you throw, you use the, the software, you rely on um, CryoSpark system and so on to throw away things that are bad. And then remarkably enough, people do quite well in finding out what their structures are. So I think the software for the early stage of image analysis, uh, they are improving and of course, um, you know, there are still improvements being made at the very high resolution end to take care of these uh, high resolution aberrations. Um, and then, of course, uh, it is nice if it happens quickly. If you collect, so I know quite a few people who've collected, shall we say, 30,000 images. That, that's like a week or several weeks work because it's a very difficult project, 30,000 images, and it takes them months and months to do the computing because it's continued running. So it always helps um, if you're, that you could call the brute force approach. I, I don't, I think we should improve the method 
so that, uh, you know, like that image of um, April ferritin, you can take one image, one image in five seconds and get the three angstrom structure. And of course, you need a good grid, you need a good specimen, everything has to be working correct. And even if you've developed the methods so that all those things are working, there will still be people who say, if I collect for a day or a week or a month, I can get to higher and higher resolution. So, you know, people will have to do what they think is the right thing. Um, but there will be improvements on all aspects of, um, of, of the software. Now, also, the, there are people working on uh, microscope control software so that you don't even have to sit there and watch it. And indeed, if you, if you come to LMB, we have three Krioses now and one Glacios. And, um, and they run every day, 24 hours, all the time. But if you go down in the evening at 9 p.m., there's nobody there. Uh, it's, it's the computer that's taking the pictures. But I think if the people decided to stay there instead of going home and having a glass of wine, they'd get much better they get more, more better data by, by sitting there and cancelling bad grids or bad holes and so on. So I think um, there'll, be a, there'll be a choice. You, you, know, you either let the, all the computers and the, uh, uh, the graphical, uh, they, they take control and they do their best and you'll get something. But it, the more you intervene manually or keep an eye on it uh, in terms of quality control, you'll get better um, results in less time by doing that. So I think exactly how it develops will depend on individual. Um, and, and of course, there are people who don't, they have no interest in watching it. They just want their structure. They prefer to give you a test tube with a sample in it, and then you send them back the coordinates. Yeah. And, and there are companies that do that now. So yeah, that's a different ways forward. Well, I've never used Topaz, but I've used Crayolo, and it's quite impressive what the um, artificial intelligence uh, uses when comparing, for instance, with Reliant uh, on implementation with the Laplacian of Gaussian. Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions now. Okay. So again, I want to thank you, uh, Professor Henderson, and of course, thank to all the all the, the, the people that attended. Uh, see you again in a few months with our next um, guest, our next uh, panelist, which will be Tamir Gonan from UCLA. Okay, so thank you, Professor, Professor Hansen, and thank you again, all of you for attending. See you.